Okay. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, Martin Martin uh, is best known for her work on the Homelessness <laughs> Reduction Act uh, during almost a decade of work as a senior parliamentary assistant um, and is now part of the campaigns team in the National Homelessness Charity Crisis. Um, she's a form, also a former Lincoln Cathedral chorister as well. So, I'm back um, home. so yeah, she's, uh, she's back home. And she's going to talk to us about the campaign to scrap the 1824 vagrants. <laughs> so, please welcome Martin. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thanks to Owen, he's kind of slightly squeezed me in today, so I was a little bit of a last minute addition. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk about this because there's a lot going on at the moment. Um, so I'm going to just launch straight into it. So I'm just going to go through a little bit about what is the Vagrancy Act, what is the problem, why is it there, why do we have it. I'm going to talk a bit about the frameworks that we're using at Crisis and a little bit about what you can do as well. Um, so, here we have a piece of legislation from 1824. Um, it is the bit of legislation which does make it a crime to sleep rough or beg in England and Wales. Um, so, with anyone being seen liable for arrest. Um, figures indicate, and we were surprised to find this, that it is still in use, and it is still in use by pretty much all police forces. Um, and we would contend it does absolutely nothing to solve the issue at all. Um, in fact, it's pushing people far further away from the sort of services that help them move away from the streets. Um, a couple of examples, you may, be, uh, you may remember the recent case in 2014 where three men were uh, arrested for taking some food from a skip uh, outside Iceland. Uh, so they were arrested under the Vagrancy Act for being in an enclosed space, i.e. trespassing. Um, but there was a huge amount of public outcry and the CPS dropped the case. Uh, we've had another few cases. One I think is really interesting and there's a, a guy called Kevin uh, sleeping rough in Carlisle in Wales. Um, a child just threw two pounds into his sleeping bag. Um, and he was arrested and fined £100. He hadn't been begging, he was just sleeping. A child thought they were doing the right thing, and that was the result. So why is this a problem? Well, here's how it works at the moment. We've got a sort of circular loop happening, and these are just cases where people actually get arrested and prosecuted. But of course, there are a lot of people who are moved on using this legislation as well. Uh, so you tend to get arrested, you will end up with a spot fine, go around the loop at a magistrate's court, once you've got that fine, you're sort of, you're less trustful, you're afraid, you, you don't want that to happen again. And how do you pay that fine? Well, you probably end up begging or doing something else to fund that. And you know what? You may get arrested for the Regency Act again. Uh, so we would contend, and a lot of the question here is, uh, well, what do you think it should be then? Because that was something we've had to answer quite a lot in this. Well, we believe that uh, the police need to be paired with teams to, outrage, uh, to um, identify and engage people with their support. There should be partnerships going on. Uh, and then that takes you on a, a journey which goes in a direction and it has an ending, hopefully ending, with permanent uh, accommodation. Um, so I'm going to go through a lot of data stuff here, but I really wanted to bring this in first the impact on people directly. These are people that we've encountered during this campaign that we've just we've met and who have stories to tell us. Now, um, at the top, Carl is a crisis member. He lives in Liverpool. Uh, so he was first arrested in uh, 2008, and that was just for asking for 20p for a phone call. And his experience was that they just find him. He got sent back to the streets, and that was it. There was no more help. Um, and Pudsey, who is not a crisis member, but we've uh, we encountered him uh, through our research and our sort of case study work. Uh, he has 13 charges under the Vagrancy Act, which is really incredible. Um, and so a lot of, and the most important thing about his story is that he says five of these warnings when I was were when I was asleep. Um, so how could I have been actually begging? So this is actually quite an important part of this, and I want to keep want you to keep that in mind if you don't mind as we go forward. Um, so it has been repealed in Scotland already, um, and through a, a, some legislation there. But uh, so we're focusing on England, England and Wales. Um, there's a bit of data that I've added in about as we've got a 10-year gap. Now we're not talking about huge numbers, but I want you to remember that this is about people who've been prosecuted, not just people who've been picked up or moved on under the Vagrancy Act. Um, so you might want to have a quick look and try and find your local area and see what you think. Um, internationally, um, it's quite important to note that we did, we have um, exported the Vagrancy Act, as Britain quite often does with legislation, and there are examples of it around the world, often based on the very text that we have. Um, but 
or without question, around the world it is changing. So the USA uh, had a, a succession of vagrancy laws that they um, got rid of in the 70s. Uh, Belgium has abolished, abolished its law against vagrants, and they did that in 1993. Uh, Finland, 1883 vagrancy law was repealed in 1987. Uh, and the Canadian Ministry of Justice has just last year been pushing through uh, some sort of to zombify, some laws to zombify the current vagrancy laws that they have, and that was all based on stuff that we've exported. Um, so, just a few bit on the, a little bit on the local stats. Um, so, it has been falling. Uh, we found it's fallen in 28 of the 43 police forces uh, using it. Uh, but of course, the highest areas are quite obviously the big cities: London, uh, Greater Manchester. But a little bit there with Cheshire, Northumbria, and the West Midlands um, increasing their uses. Uh, so here's a quick one on the historical context because it is really important for understanding why we've still got a 195-year piece of legislation on the go here. Um, so for context, in 1824, we had the Earl of Liverpool was the Prime Minister. Uh, Lord Byron was dying of fever on his way to the Ottomans. Australia was officially named Australia that year. Um, and life expectancy in the UK was about 40. Um, and that is also the year from which the government still gets its statutory underpinning for rough sleeping. Um, so I put it in context for the timeline. So 1824, the Vagrancy Act, that predates the Metropolitan Police. Um, it predates the opening of the franchise. Um, it predates the second slavery abolition act, the one that actually did the trick. The slightly earlier one didn't. Um, and it predates the Factory Act, which was the one which outlawed uh, children under the age of nine working for a certain amount of time by quite substantial years. So this is the context, of what, which makes you just think, why are we, why are we still using this piece of legislation? Um, and a little bit about what it's been used for over the years is also equally fascinating. Um, <laughs> So it's tended to be used for whatever causes moral outrage. It's not just been about homelessness and rough sleeping and all of the issues related. It's a bit of a catch-all. Um, and some just interesting ones being the streaking, um, the, the busking. Uh, I, I actually am a vagrant, I have to admit. I'm bust in Lincoln. Um, and I had a lot of fun finding these icons, but it just gives you a bit of a picture <laughs> for the sort of things that's been used for. How is this the case? Oh, oh actually, I've missed a slide. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. The reason for it is, um, well, so I'll just go into the language. So reframing it, this is what the actual uh, Vagrancy Act says. So this is a piece of legislation um, which has the two sections, section three and section four, that we need to uh, look at. The first one is the one that's used for begging most often. It's, it is the most used part. And the second one, section four, is the part where um, we're talking about people who are sleeping rough. Um, and just look at the language we've got here. We've got punishment, we've got idle, disorderly persons, rogues, vagabonds, um, and yeah. So I'm going to very quickly launch into a, sl a slight sidestep, but it's very relevant. This is a bit of research that Crisis has been doing, um, which underpins why we're campaigning on the Vagrancy Act itself. Um, and the Museum of Homelessness, you, thank you, you mentioned our frameworks uh, research earlier. Um, so I'm just going to go quickly into it. We've got, we had uh, 10,000 people were surveyed as part of this framework. The Frameworks Institute, I should say, is a non-profit think tank. Um, and so they look at social scientific issues. Um, and we commissioned this uh, research to sort of look at how the sector is best able to actually talk to the public and motivate them in the correct terms. Um, so some of the findings are quite interesting. Um, so they used uh, values uh, that were chosen because it's the sort of things that they usually use for their work, but it came out with some really interesting stuff. So the two values that they found were most important for talking to people, uh, the moral human rights and interdependence values. And I know this is a lot of data in one slide, but um, so they, they were sort of testing what is it that motivates someone, for example, if you look at benefits policies, it's a nice easy one at the end there. Um, so if you talk about it in terms of compassion, you talk about it in terms of equality of opportunity, if you talk about independence, you talk about moral human rights, what is it that causes people to think, yes, I need to take action, I need to engage? And it turned out that moral human rights had a significant impact on getting people to support those sort of policies. So this sort of starts us off on a journey of being able to frame how we talk to people, how we bring them in on this and not sort of other them and think, I can actually do something here. 
Um, so the moral human rights uh, framework, now the key thing here is that this is um, a moral frame, it's not a legal one, because human rights does come with some legal connotations, it's not about that. Um, this is about just saying, in our society, we believe in treating people with dignity and humanity and upholding everyone's basic human rights. Um, all of us as human beings have a moral right to, to, to decent housing, etc. Um, it's kind of about highlighting commonality, about the fact we're all human, we all have the same needs. Um, and it it's sort of helps people to uh, address homelessness as a moral imperative and it boosts people's personal engagement on the issue and motivates support for per, uh, policy change. Uh, and there's a bit of an example there of just the sort of language you might use, which is everyone has the right to be treated with dignity. Living with dignity means having access to decent housing, so let's commit to protecting this essential human need. Um, the second component, interdependence, so we are all common members of an interconnected society and we depend on each other. Um, homelessness does affect us all and addressing homelessness strengthens our society as a whole. Um, so we can use this to help people see homelessness from a societal perspective and generate that support for collective action, which for crisis is really important when we're coming up with our campaigns. How do we get people to feel that they can make a difference in that and make an impact? Um, so a little bit of the example again of what that sort of language looks like. It's uh, what affects one of us affects us all. It's all quite straightforward really. When some people are struggling, it hurts everyone. And right now many people are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless, which makes it harder to contribute to and share in our country's prosperity. Um, and making sure that everyone has safe and stable housing benefits, uh, benefits all of us by creating a stronger, more productive society where everything, everyone can contribute and we all benefit. Uh, so we also had a look at some of the more common things which people in the sector might be using and we came across this three paychecks idea. Um, this is a big one that lots of people just find themselves slipping into and using. Um, so we are all three paychecks from homelessness. It's that it could affect absolutely anyone. And the honest truth is that was not helpful. Um, it did not produce any results particularly. It didn't really inspire people to actually do something. Um, and the reason behind this, to be honest, was a sort of, it generated a bit of sort of fatalism. You know, it's sort of, it's an inevitable thing that we can't escape. Um, so therefore, there's not really a lot I can do about it. Um, but that does go against what your instinct when you're talking about this might be. You might think, well, it could happen to anyone, so therefore, why don't you help? But actually, that doesn't really motivate people to help. Um, so the big thing we found was this idea of constant pressure is kind of the key. And I'm really, really rushing through what the actual <laughs> research is here. There's a lot more to it. I'm just trying to go on the key points. So the idea of this constant pressure was the thing that really motivated people to actually think about it in the correct terms. And when we say framing, it's about sort of looking at, you could say something to somebody, but how do you say it in such a way that they immediately start getting the ideas? Um, so often you'll go to someone in the street maybe and say, okay, how do we solve homelessness? And they'll go, mm, uh, well, uh, maybe uh, the government should probably do something. If you say, okay, well, poverty puts pressure on people and it's like water pushing against the dam. There's a lot of different things that happen that pushes against, pushes against it, maybe bills, council tax, and maybe all these different things. It gives them a frame which allows them to think, oh yeah, I know what that can be like. I know how we get from A to B. You know, I know ways that can, it can be mitigated. I can see steps. And you start to get responses more like, well, perhaps we should look at housing. Perhaps we should look at um, welfare policy. Suddenly people start finding that their mind is unlocked and they think, yeah, I can understand this process. And that's the real importance of this sort of metaphor. It's not the only metaphor that was tested. They tested things like stickiness, like did that motivate people to think about it in the right terms and it didn't really make much of an impact. Um, but just to give you the little example of the constant pressure metaphor, how it's used, it's that poverty puts constant pressure on people, and if the pressure builds up, people can be pushed into homelessness. It seems very straightforward, but you know, it's not actually being used. It's not something that's being worked into people's um, descriptions of how we approach the issue. Um, and just to, to widen that out, out a tiny bit, I'm just going to explain the prototypical story versus non-prototypical. It's very researchy language, but all it means is, a typical story might be, um, 
you know, a guy who has alcohol problems and a beard sitting on a street corner. You know, it's that classic thing that people tend to think of. Non-prototypical is more someone's trapped in temporary accommodation for a long period. It's, it's the things that you don't necessarily immediately associate with homelessness. So they, they tested a lot of that as well. And so we found, I think, if you combine the constant pressure and the non-prototypical story thing, Again, I'm going to go with the benefits policies because just because that's such a difficult thing to talk to policymakers about, but it's actually really key to some of this work. Look at the incredible difference it made. And this is actually, the Frameworks Institute said this is really rare. We don't tend to get things which cause such an impact in the change of thinking. Um, so adding those two things, uh, the constant pressure and someone, a story that you wouldn't necessarily associate with homelessness straight off, um, created a huge amount of support in the public. So, we, we think that this is something that can be changed and can be done. Um, and there are other things that you know, we have to look at, like the non-prototypical story didn't do a great deal for societal causes in terms of that. Um, but overall, it made quite an interesting impact. And I would definitely recommend reading the full Frameworks report, because I've very much squeezed this into a very short summary there. But the summary of what this means is so, Using the value of moral human rights to connect and drive policy support. Uh, so this is saying clear, clearly and powerfully that everyone has a right to dignity and respect and it's part of the basic humanity uh, that we, and that increases people's responsibility for addressing homelessness. Um, using that value of interdependence to place the issue of homelessness in a social context. This helps us to highlight what affects one of us affects all of us. Um, explain what causes homelessness using that constant pressure metaphor by giving people vivid and true to life ways of explaining how homelessness uh, happens. Um, by talking about the issues such as the pressures of poverty uh, and high housing costs. Um, tell a wider range of stories uh, about the lived experience of homelessness, talking about rough sleeping taps into people's existing mental uh, image of homelessness. So talking about other forms, including temporary accommodation, sofa surfing, uh, that can be combined with that constant pressure metaphor to bring a bit of a context to the story you're trying to, to give. And avoid othering language, that's a key one. That just creates that distance. It's evoking sadness or pity for them. And I say them in inverted commas. <laughs> Um, and avoid claims that we are all risk at homelessness, even if that seems like something that you should say, because it just doesn't shift attitudes, it doesn't create any sort of policy support, because it just com conflicts with people, um, with, it, it just conflicts with the sort of ideas that people with lived experience have, and recognition that some people aren't all at risk of homelessness. Um, so I think we're not doing too bad for time, so I'm just quickly going to go into the actual campaign itself. Uh, so why are we doing this and why now? Uh, the government is actually doing a review into homelessness legislation, which is expected to report in March 2020. Uh, that little snippet in green though is directly lifted from their rough sleeping strategy. So the Vacancy Act is part of it, so we have a window here, um, and that's why we've decided to go on this. And this wasn't something that we as crisis were planning to do, but we saw the opportunity and said, we've got to take it, we've got to try. Um, so behind the scenes, we know that the ministry, uh, the MHCLG and the Home Office uh, are all actually actively working on that review right now. They're not waiting, they're getting it going. Um, and so we've been doing our best to sort of influence that. We believe that there is a lot of support for the option of repeal in some parts um, and a lot of stonewalling in others. So there's a bit of a hump there. Uh, but we know that the Home Office has just taken legal advice. What that says, I'm afraid they will not say, but we don't expect it to be too radically different from what we have. And that comes quickly to our approach. We have a report. I have one here. I have three copies. Don't all rush if anyone wants one. <laughs> that was all I could carry. Um, so we've been talking to people. That this is not the first campaign to repeal the Vagrancy Act. You'll be shocked to hear. It's been 200 years of people trying to. Um, so the approach we took was trying to do it a little bit differently and actually talk to the people who are most likely to be against repeal and try and understand that perspective and come up with the right answers. So that means the police, it means magistrates, police and crime commissioners. Um, and we also wanted to make it very, very legally watertight. So we took not one, but two pieces of legal advice, very um, <laughs> comprehensive, to basically uh, prove that it's not actually needed. The police may still be using it, but if there is something that they tend to use the Vagrancy Act for, um, it's probable that there is more modern legislation which is far better drafted, far, far more effective to use. And that's things like trespassing, perhaps, or fraudulent behaviour, um, highways and obstruction, things like that. Um, 
So we have quite a lot of coalition partners and supporters on this campaign now. Um, we only just launched officially on the 19th of June. Um, so we just got a brand new uh, campaign partner in Liberty. Um, but we're also very proud, of course, to have uh, it's actually over 45 now, I think, um, supporting organisations. Uh, they're not all up there, I couldn't fit them all on. Um, but the Museum of Homelessness, of course, was one of our early take-ups, so yes, thank you for that. And essentially, we're still looking for organisations to show their support, so if you're, you do have any thoughts on that, and if you're part of an organisation, just head to the website and let us know that you want to be part of this. Um, and just to summarise, um, it's beyond the damaging effect on individuals. There's a broader context to how the public think of homeless people and these solutions presented. And we just think it's time to move away from that language of vagrancy and talk about people under constant pressure and the policies that can actually make a difference and alleviate that pressure. Um, and so the final words are, are you able to join the campaign? And most importantly of all, how are you putting out in your own communications? Um, we had a very thorough look at ours and there are a few put bits that we were like, wow, we didn't realise we were putting out those messages. We, you know, someone in a, one department may have drafted it, it's been used and disseminated around. Um, we need to change that. So Crisis itself is going through a very big programme of training everybody, looking at everything we put out, making sure that we're using the right language, metaphors, we're not othering, um, and we very much encourage others to do the same. Um, any questions? <laughs> Thank you.